live. <laughs> Happy Sunday, everyone, with episode six of The Body Talks. How exciting is this? It's already episode six. Today, my guest is going to be Kemi Onabule, who is an amazing young artist um, with um, a Nigerian and Greek heritage. And Kemi paints amazing bodies. And not just that, she paints nature, she paints much more. And we're going to have a conversation about um, the, her practice and much more. And fun fact before I invite Kemi in the, in the show, um, for Trini London followers, you know there is, we have a, a shade of foundation called Kemi. It's actually uh, named after Kemi herself, who was one of our first, very first models. So this is very exciting and it's a very... Um, subtle inside hi Sylvia uh, okay let's invite Kemi in and then we're going to ask her all about her art practice and maybe a little bit about her modeling career as well um feel free to ask any questions and let's find Kemi hi 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 Dexter hi everyone let's find Kemi so <laughs> How's everyone's Sunday? This sunny Sunday in London is so beautiful. Let's see if I can see Kemi. Not yet. Um, have you had the chance to see the sort of presentation I um, I anticipated in stories yesterday? I hope so. I hope you saw some of her amazing paintings. Um, they're just they're just amazing, and she's very young and. She already like she. She's with different galleries, um. She's doing an amazing job. Hi, Rhiannon. Hi, everyone. I'm just waiting for Kemi to uh jump in the interview. Let's see where she is. Meanwhile, what would you ask? I already have my my questions prepared, but what would you ask to someone, uh, to a painter? Like, is there anything that, um, so far you asked me to ask her about her inspiration, what she does, but is there anything else that you are interested in knowing? Let's see what Kemi is. Do, do, do. Mm hmm I can't see her. Morning, Carolyn. How's everyone? Hi. <laughs> Many of you joining. Hello, hello. Let's check in Kemi. Hey, Kemi. Ba -ba -ba -ba. <laughs> um, to get a known artist together. How do you start to paint? What the process? Thank you, Rhiannon. That was one of mine. I love it. Getting in the headspace. Yes, exactly. But also, not just that, I'm going to ask her about how... Yeah, that's great. Okay. Hey, me. I'm messaging her on the other phone. <laughs> Will you join the live? This is live. Hi, everyone. Maybe this is actually helpful. So many of you, more of you will be able to join in. Does she still enjoy the process or just the results? That's a great one. I might start with yours, you see. Hi, Kemi, here you go. Here you go. Uh, here she is. Exactly. Colette, this is one of the answers. Hi, <laughs> Kemi. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> we made it. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm very well. Sun is shining in London. Exactly. It's beautiful. Can you see me okay? I can see you perfectly clear and sharp. Love it. Love that blue top. Brilliant. And everything. And then Thank the little you. plant at the side. Very, very artistic. I dare it's to Very say. aesthetic. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm good. I had a really relaxed morning. Yeah. Um, I went to go and pick mulberries with which was great. There's like a mulberry tree near me. So I went to go and pick some berries. Okay. had a very, very foraged kind of like natural morning, which was really good. That's um, so, Where do you live? Well, I'm, I live between kind of like Croydon, which is South London. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, basically I've been there for the last however many weeks um since lockdown but then i went to my parents back to my parents and they live near milton Keynes area so okay. i've kind of been going between 
Um, but yeah, all very, mainly in the countryside, to be honest, or just outside of London. Okay. Uh, which Sounds is lovely. Really nice. It's very green, which I like. Which you uh, like because it's also in your, in your work. <laughs> How have you been? I have been. This is really exciting because actually, all the guests of this series are all people that I know, but I haven't really sp spoken with them in in, in ages. Yes, and it's yes. also um a, a chance to reconnect, reconnect. And we we don't talk before this interview, so it's it's a proper yes. sort of like a call. And I'm like, hey, how are you doing? How have you been? <laughs> but it's live, so this is exciting. It's exciting, very exciting. <laughs> I have been okay, yeah. I'm in London as well. Um, cool. yeah, up and ups and downs due to the world conditions, but exactly. overall, I've been uh, I, I feel I've been quite very lucky with all of it anyway. And um, yeah, yeah, I had a really relaxing morning as well. I make myself breakfast, and we have a little guard back garden. So That's I was nice. outside with my spinach and yeah. eggs. So did you enjoy terrible. did you enjoy the heat wave or was that that was intense? I don't know if anyone enjoyed that heat wave. <laughs> well, so being an Italian, uh to me is not like the end of the world. Crazy, but I have yeah. to say, being indoors on a computer working while the heat wave happens and having the heat of the computer on your face, that's that's always never, oh, that's well. never pleasant. I was in the studio on that day and my studio is so hot. So there's like two levels. Uh, there's the upper level where I am, which is like yeah. a greenhouse, basically. It's so okay. warm because it's a glass roof. And then below is this beautifully cold studios, which I'm not in. So I just have to go up and down all day to like regulate my temperature. It was, I, I did not enjoy this for a few yeah. days. I also had a meeting uh, with someone at Google and I think YouTube and it was funny because um, Trini joined in and she's like, how are you doing with the heat wave? And they were all pick picking up their fans. The fans. I have this, I have this, I have nothing. So everyone had their <laughs> way of coping with it. I don't have, I need a fan. I forget about fans. There's, yeah. there's technology to help me out in a crisis. I always forget that. <laughs> it's technology, yeah. But yeah, I don't have one either. So yeah. I opened the window and, uh, and hope for some breeze, but you get what I get. <laughs> okay, well, how have you been? Uh, well, let's. We have a few questions from uh, different people, so I'm wondering whether we should start with them or leave them for the end. Um, okay. but actually, one is one of the ones that also I wanted to start with, which is like, tell us a bit about your process. And well, let me get it. It's from Rhiannon. Um, so how do you start to paint? Where's the, what's the process of getting in the headspace, connecting uh, it where, where you're at now? I feel like, to be honest, like going into nature and seeing kind of being, because I don't know if I find inspiration in the city necessarily, despite living there and spending most of my time there. So mm -hmm. I think being outside of the city, being kind of within green spaces, um, around family I get inspired around friends I get inspired because I think the obsession for me is bodies in nature bodies our relationship to nature our relationship to one another so it kind of for me they coexist and it's very important for me to have that regular contact with nature if I feel like I've you know just been going to the studio back and forth too much i don't i don't feel inspiration actually I, I kind of get a bit kind of sick of seeing four walls so mm -hmm. it's really important to go and see like wide expanses of nature beautiful landscapes all of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. I, I think i've always been like that actually since a child that's what i was interested in yeah and do you, what do you do to capture what you see? Like, w will you then draw and paint by memory or would you take photos or would you sketch when you're in nature? What's the process? To be honest, I kind of, I don't know. I was, it's a very tactile process. So maybe I'll pick things, I'll go and pick flowers or things like that, or I'll just be in nature for a while and take my sketchbook. I tend to write actually about nature and then or about things that have been going through my head and then from the writing I'll get a title 
or I'll get a concept and then that will turn into an image. Uh, I used to direct paint more directly from kind of imagery and, and from real life. And I found that it was kind of trapping me a bit. I'd get obsessed with the image in front of me. So okay. now I kind of, I go from imagination mainly, but things that have influenced me oops, from imagination. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's how it tends to work for me. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, I, I understand that sort of like being trapped into something that maybe you sketched already or you feel like you need to represent and then it's not really what your soul and what your yeah creativity wants you to actually exactly do so on these and um, tying in with the title of this series and with the fact that you just confirmed you're obsessed with bodies and nature um the series is called the body talks so the question is a sort of like so what do your bodies say to you and to people that look at them what message do they have i think they are not constrained by maybe social constructs around uh women being ladylike or being beautiful or being presentable or being even sexual to a certain extent i don't think my paintings or my drawings or my prints are sexual i think they're they're in the in the classic kind of sense of the nude their representation of humanity away from kind of civilization or just the way we are and i think this obsession with the the naked body comes mainly because we don't reveal it enough we're not we're, you know, there's, there's so much, yeah there's so much taboo around it so much fear around it um so for me, kind of, it was always from doing portraits initially, it was always the next step to kind of just paint the whole body, but not closed. You know, I hate painting. Firstly, I hate painting clothes, but... <laughs> Fair enough. I hate painting cloth. But, um, <laughs> and also the body is beautiful and the female form is beautiful and the male form is beautiful. But I think, yeah, there's this, and I want to push it further and make it more kind of engaging and more, maybe more close up than it is at the moment. But yeah. And I come from traditions, his, like my granddad is Greek and I've always kind of been, Greek culture really fascinates me, both the history, Greek history, we're strong, we're kind of intense people. Um, but their relationship to art and the naked body within, especially uh, ancient Greek art, is really interesting. So it's always kind of been around like the Hellen Hellenic relationship to the body and kind of body beautiful. So it's always kind of going through my mind in that way. So I think that's where that kind of comes from. Yeah. My mind was of a Greek sculpture, actually. <laughs> it was, I was imagining like, you know, this massive amazing sculptures of bodies that come from greek culture yes and yeah i remember now that you that you mentioned it i remember one class at uni that was on eco iconoclasm and uh, there was a sort of a research i don't know where i'm going there but um it was about the fact that the the, the greek culture was more liberated in terms of body in terms of religion as well and it was yes it was not like it was the, the the last time that the body and the and the people were free before um the catholic yes. uh, and the romans taking over and putting like not yet, taboos on it yeah yeah, so, yeah. It, it it and it is interesting because modern greek culture especially with um orthodoxy and all of that kind of stuff is they're not conservative in many ways but the 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 reflection of ancient Greek culture is always in the society. So people are very relaxed about themselves. You know, they don't, they don't feel shame about their bodies, about, you know, their, their age. It's, it's a less, it's almost like people are less stressed out by those things. And growing up in Britain, I always felt, and same, my dad's Nigerian, so I have that Nigerian history. And Nigerians are also, they're less conscious of those things. They're less kind of like obsessed about 
being thin or being beautiful or being, you know, being beautiful is what you make it. You, you dress up to be beautiful. It's not that you have to be beautiful intrinsically. And I like that. I think that's, I think there's a, an equality in that, that I think is kind of missing in Western, especially like Europe, maybe British and American ideas of the body are very shame related. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety around it. Even, you know, when you go to Europe, you, you can sunbathe topless and all that. Kind of, but in Britain, that is like, you know, it just doesn't happen. And I find that really, yeah, it, you internalise that as a woman. So I think maybe my work is about decoding those things and getting away from those things. Yeah. Well, I can tell you from my experience that yet, yes, like at least in Ita Italian culture, yes, you can you sunbathe naked and everything, but you will always be judged by how you look. Mm. Like the shame and the fat phobia and the non-perfection phobia, it's, it's a thing in Europe it's as well. It's very profound, yeah. And uh, I actually, it's funny because when I go there, I feel even more attacked by it than when I am in London. So okay. it depends probably how you experience it, but I think both societies are really, really... Scared. Uh, pushed down by this weight of like perfection mm. and mm. everything that capitalism wanted us to be a, be shamed of and to yes, be able to yeah. be changed by things you can buy. And it, I, I think it it falls mainly on women in that in that regard. That yes, pressure. exactly. Because yeah. I know that, yeah, I know that in especially in Italy, there's definitely probably way more weight put on women and how they look and why they look the way they do than men. Yeah, uh, 100%. 100%. And same here. Uh, I, so it's kind of, it's an interesting thing. And I think women are, in a way, less, they, they're trying to break free of these things. So I think, in, not that my work is solely related to that, but it is, it's related to, how we see ourselves in the world and we we can't always see ourselves through one another you know we have to look at the we have to see ourselves through the nat the nature that we impact on to you know the the way we treat animals the, the way we treat so many things it has to be yeah. related yeah and if we treat those things well we'll treat ourselves well in a way yeah I mean, we are also a product of the society and the environment that we live in. So we need to, like, the dialogue needs to be there as well. In fact, um, you, in, your state, in one of your statements, uh, you say that your paintings are sort of like a response to a world that seems in chaos, which <laughs> can be even more perfect for times <laughs> like how they are now. In yeah. terms of all the dysfunctions of, of the, of, like nowadays society ecological economic and everything yeah um so how do you find like creating uh in lockdown like the situation of the world that you found we found ourselves in in the last i think few months did mm. that impact your your work or did that enhance it like what how did you work during those times i mean to be honest it was a mixed it's a blessing and a curse because yeah. obviously there are people who are losing their lives during the, this period and so any good that you cut that you receive from it is always counterbalanced by that feeling of oh you know this is this is causing this is costing people their lives it's costing people their economic ability to fend for themselves all of that stuff I found it maybe because I was getting a bit tired of, you know, moving all the time, working all the time, especially being in a city, there's a tendency where you just never stop. Yep. So I kind of felt, found myself feeling like, oh, I, by the time lockdown happened, I didn't realise how exhausted I was. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it happened, it gave me this kind of nine, 10, 11 week period of, not really doing much beyond what I wanted to do, which was to make work and make, you know, I made loads of prints. I kind of thought about what I wanted to do. 
I decided to kind of maybe just give painting solely a focus for for a while and plus all the other stuff I do uh like music and modeling and all that kind of stuff and just to kind of let go of the fear of of trusting in those things and actually trust in the fact that creativity can be so powerful and it can bring you so many beautiful things even during such a difficult time so I felt quite comforted by what I I felt comforted comforted by the fact that I could make paintings and I could make prints and I could make music and you know it, it I felt like a kid again to a certain extent and so it's given me an extra boost of feeling oh you know it's it's what I was what I'm saying in the work and my feelings about the work sadly are being confirmed by the world you know you don't want the world to be in chaos but it kind of isn't to a certain extent, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, so feeding off the themes that are existing in the planet already made me feel like, oh, I have to make work that that means something and is universal because I do think the work should be universal, uh, and the human form is pretty universal. So yeah. I, I work with that. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. Actually, yeah, just to go off topic for a second from, from, from the painting, you also do music. I actually didn't mention it in your presentation. Yes, I love seeing your videos with your guitar. Thank you. Like, creating is amazing. <laughs> Thank so, you. Like, when did you start doing, like, playing? I mean, I play guitar for a long time. I'm not brilliant at it. I do it because... <laughs> You're very it good. Helps, it helps me sing, so... <laughs> Uh, so I started making music, probably like recording little things from about the age of 17, 18. There's, I've got a lot of music, but they're projects that I'm trying to push together at the moment. Um, so, But it's always been something that I've loved doing, have been quite good at. So when you're good at something as a kid, everyone is like, oh, you should do this. So I think, you know, the show off in me always like to get up and perform um so yeah so i've always i've always played piano i play piano and guitar and if i'm making a song i'll play whatever instrument i need to on it but um yeah so that's always an undercurrent so there are lots of things that i do uh and i feel like they're all very cons they all kind of work in the same theme and have the same intention behind them mm -hmm. really <laughs> And do you find there's a connection between your music and your art? I, I think so. I, in the sense that maybe not, obviously it's hard to build an aesthetic line or have an aesthetic line through music and art, but I think they are joined in their intention, which is to bring people closer, make people feel understood like mm -hmm. others understand them that they're not isolated and that you know not everything has to be showy and beautiful and and uh dramatic i think my music is quite quiet and calming yeah. uh, and intense which is another side of me because in actual in person i'm not that intense but my music is very intense so uh yeah it's an outlet i feel like a lot of the things i do are an outlet to to for me to be understood and for other people to understand so and to kind of connect those things together really beautiful uh yeah i love this yeah the, the, as, you express a side of you through music which is different from what, what you are who you are like not who you are who's the same thing who it's you but it's i love yeah it's an out there yeah i love i love it's, it's a, yeah it's a, i don't really see them as they're all part of the same thing that allows me to express i mean you do so many different things it's probably similar <laughs> for you in a way it's, if you have a personality where you're generally a creative person you're always looking to uh, expand the yeah. way that you do it yeah um, yeah in fact like your work as well just to carry on with the, the statement i picked from um goes 
and picks up the themes of identity and belonging, which are the themes that you actually just um, mentioned about mm -hmm. making people feel like part of something, they're not alone. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's you, true. I don't. Go on, go on, Karen. No, 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 you go on, you go on. <laughs> well, for me, I think growing up with several different cultures uh, represented in my household and then ex when you extend that outwards and you go out into the world and you represent all these things physically and mentally because I'm, you know, I've got so many worlds colliding. Uh, I think you can often growing up feel like, ooh, it, I'm very unusual. Not that I am or not that I'm particularly interesting, but my uh, understanding of things is quite, or my understanding of cultures and people is quite wide ranging, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you see the universal qualities in everybody. And then you also have this quite contradictory and complex identity as your, within yourself. So I think you're always trying to figure yourself out, figure people out, figure out your relationship to the world. So I think maybe that comes out in the work. It's very prevalent. I think anyone who's moved to a different country or is from a different place to the one that they live in yeah. is always figuring these things out subliminally. I'm yeah. sure you, you yeah. have as well. I, yeah, I feel, I feel in the same way in terms of I'm always, I feel always in a journey of discovery of my own identity on different levels like work, mm -hmm sexuality like art uh yes because it's always when you when you have um cultural baggage or heritage and you you move somewhere else there is always the i'm taking it with me i'm adapting i'm 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 absorbing what i see but also mm. keeping what i had how mm. much of what i had do i have to take out how much like how much of what i to me is like uh, normal in inherent in what i have is understood by the, the people where yeah, I'm, yeah. that I'm communicating yeah, yeah, yeah. with <laughs> and yeah. how much do I have to actually express it so that people understand where I stand, like what, where mm. do I come from? Yes, so yes. I think it's a constant and however you do it, like with like painting or uh, video or writing or music, there is always this research of identity and there's always this search for belonging that yes. is ultimate what everyone in the world looks for yes uh, to to have a exactly and when you transfer uh to a different place it kind of you have to sense that you know people back home will probably naturally they'll feel this place but they won't feel it to the same extent but when you are in a different country or you're from a different place but you've grown up in a different country you have to kind of synthesize it for yourself so you have to build your family build your community build your work contacts you have to build everything from scratch and that could be a very exhausting experience so i'm two generations in now but even i recognize the the strain it can put on uh people and i think uh yeah it's just it's, it's so it's very interesting it's these are important conversations yeah to have because I think people can become very insular and you know stressed by the their 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 natural understanding which is different to someone else's um so I feel like yeah maybe I'm trying to communicate communicate across those boundaries within the work across cultural boundaries and all of that kind of stuff mm. um and make it as almost flat as possible so people can project onto it what they want mm. really yeah beautiful yeah yeah and talking identity and i'm interested in um i the concept of identity as an artist when do you actually sort of um not not much how do you build your identity as an artist but when do you actually recognize yourself as an artist and are proud of it and not because i know a lot of people that create art and, and they they're like oh i'm not really an artist or like they're oh, scared, of meeting, they're, they're scared of it that they're scared of actually yeah uh defining themselves as such mm. where, do you have a point specific in your life where you a decided you wanted to be an artist or b 
realized that you actually already were and actually yeah. with pride just said okay i'm actually an artist i'm work working towards this to be honest i think that i never really had in a way i never had a choice in it because my parents are in the creative industries my dad's a musician and a songwriter and my mum worked with him and has worked with him for years so they were always artists we always lived a very artistic life without knowing it you know we make we make things instead of get by them or you know everything was made everything was created everything was um hand picked for us and i think that's an artistic lifestyle if you're not yeah. willing to just take everything for granted and take what society gives you and instead you decide you're going to make your own version of things i think that's artistic i think yeah. you know anyone can really be an artist a, a great gardener is an artist in my eyes or, or someone who creates great meals is an artist i'm sure people be pissed off by that but i think you know <laughs> it's whatever you make it i i don't think i ever thought i wasn't not an artist in the grand like european style of you know just like gallery shows and all of that but i thought you know i i can't do anything else so i'm gonna do this and if that makes me an artist then i'm an artist which i probably okay. uh so yeah it was never a choice i was always like you know well this this is who i am so i'm just gonna do it uh really and it's it's difficult it requires a lot of discipline and self-belief to have an idea and follow through with it and not feel any shame because yeah. I think maybe when I was a bit younger, I did feel shame, maybe in my, not in myself, but in my ideas. But I think I'm kind of over that now, all that feeling of shame, you know? Yeah. And yes, I understand 100%. Do you think that, and I agree uh, with the concept of being an artist. I also know that, as you said, European way of, of seeing an artist is like putting sort of like, uh, putting a person, an artist, like in a, in an artwork frame or like yeah. putting an aura on top of that. Mm -hmm. And then that makes them like a- Special. Art, like an artist for the system, for the art system. So maybe yeah. there's two different concepts, being an yeah. artist and being an artist for the art system. Exactly, very true. I think that I think that's right because in a way being artistic should for me extend into every part of your life beyond your you know the the product that you make and I don't know if the modern art world rewards that it rewards product it rewards here's this thing make it keep making the same of it and I'll yeah. buy it product but, and value and money value Exactly. And and the same extends to the way that people see bodies now. It's the same idea, you know, look the same every time I see you, look great, and I'm sure someone will pay for it. But, you know, bodies are kind of weird things. Being an artist is a kind of a weird thing. So you can't expect the same thing every time. You know, we're moving, we're changing constantly. And I think so should your work, you know, so should what you do, uh, in order to live a good life and a very varied life, you should try and vary it as much as possible, change things up. Yeah. And that doesn't make you a quitter. Okay, everyone. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It makes you someone who's actually quite versatile. Yeah. I think, anyway. It I makes agree. You, it makes you able to cope with the difficulties of life when they come because you've seen it before and you can push through, you know, yeah. challenges quite yeah. easily. Yeah. Um, so this <laughs> creates two questions for me. One is, uh, well, I don't even know. Yeah. Do you think that um, going back to the, just quickly, going back to the sort of like art world, um, artist concept, um, this sort of like validation from the art world, from the art world comes when someone buys your first, uh, painting or when you like you studied art at uni uh, not at uni at art, you've done a, an art um, do, do you 
well, this is actually what I'm least interested in, too, in terms, but I want to go more into the, the, the other artistic thing. But mm. do, you feel, do you feel that your kind of like colleagues, artists feel the, feel sort of trapped in between these two worlds? Mm, what, the commercial and yeah. the... I think from friends and family and everyone I know, it's a constant tension where you're thinking, oh, should I sell very, sell things very easily? Should I make myself very available? Or do I keep myself private in order to absorb the world and to make better art? And to be honest, it's a balance. In order to live through what you do, you have to... You have to engage with people to a certain extent in a to a certain extent in a commercial way but but that's that should be in, in a way separate to the intention for the work those two you know they exist side by side but i don't think they should i don't think they should infect one another really yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a very difficult balance because you'll get people wanting you to make the same thing because it sells versus when you actually get to a certain kind of level within the art world, people just want to, you to make good art and you should be making good art. And it will, you know, you'll profit from it if you're going to profit from it anyway, because there'll be a market for that. So guessing from the, from the side of the artist, guessing about that, it's, in a way, it's not your business. Making the work is the thing that you should be doing. Yeah, it's hard to be very tunnel vision about it, but you should just make just make the work. That's I feel the only thing that has helped me or made me feel happy about my life or happy about where I'm going is to ignore everything else and just like do your work. Get in yeah. the studio, make the work, and the yeah. rest will sort itself out if it's going to. Yeah, um, yeah, really. Yeah, because I think there are people that sort of like feel constrained and not create what they want to create because they are like either requested something specific that is not what they want to do at the moment or mm. they feel like, oh, that thing said, let me just do hundreds of that thing instead of actually be authentic with themselves and actually mm -hmm. create what they feel like. Like you just said, yeah. Um, what do you like most uh, painting? What is the thing that makes you more joyful or at the moment? I mean, uh, to be honest, it's the, the new paintings that I'm making are uh, they're quite similar in their subject matter so their bodies and nature but it's the way I'm painting I feel more comfortable with you know I think I've gotten better at painting in general mm -hmm. better at letting go of what I think it should look like and enjoying what it actually is and the way I'm painting it so in, I don't think subject matter matters but the actual process of making a painting Mm -hmm. it is very is very enjoyable for me at the moment maybe because lockdown allowed me to just like not do too much and not be stressed out and not be worrying about oh, I've got this deadline I've got that deadline so I, I feel a lot more at ease in the studio and painting mm -hmm. now which is really good I hope it lasts <laughs> yeah. I yes so what is your process what what are your tools tell us more a little bit about, about like how you paint like material oil <laughs> yeah I so I use oil mainly and then I also make print so kind of very simple mono print which is just you putting ink on a plate of glass and drawing into the paper so that's a very kind of easy quick thing for me to do uh but I kind of vary. So I use oil paint and I use oil pastels and kind of, if you get close to the paintings, they kind of look like drawings, um, mm -hmm. which I enjoy. I find that more fun than sometimes trying to wrestle with oil paint, oil paint, because it's such a difficult medium to use. And I can use it very well, but being too technical with it, I'm like, it, it gets boring for me. <laughs> well, I'm like, I just want to like draw and, and enjoy myself. So, and the intention of the work, I think, is to look at it and have and get gather enjoyment and gather the enjoyment of the artist from the paintings. For me, that's what it, it is. Um, so, yeah, it, I think, I mean, it's, I feel like a two year old when I'm painting, really. 
I mean, the intention of, behind it is a lot more adult, but the feeling is the same, really. Uh, so, yeah, I just... Yeah. Which is the, I think, which is the best feeling because going back to our actually like authentic, not authentic, oh, this authentic is probably the wrong word, but our inner self, our inner child mm. is actually our true nature, I think. And then we add on all the layers and all the constraints and all the shame of our adulthood and life and stress. Exactly. And everything. exactly. But if you manage to get back there and create from that point, from that uh, state, that's actually probably ultimately it's the. Like, it's like a meditation of a kind. And I feel a lot more sane when I do it versus when I don't do it. When I don't do it, I've got like a tension and I don't know why. But when I am doing it, I realize, oh, it's because I'm not really getting down to the, to the child version of myself. And it's a great, it's an easy way in doing painting or, make, uh, or music or anything like that, uh, which I really, I really love. I don't know, I'd be probably a bit nuts without it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, um, you make me think of like when I do, you know, I do improv, uh, yes. improv, improv comedy, improv theater, and the ultimate feeling when you when you do improv to be able to actually create something that then resonates with the audience is when you feel free to actually play like mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. like you were a kid, like you were yourself. Not that you decide to play, but you have to basically let like take away, strip off all the um, all the rules that people give you, all the fear of failure that society yeah. gives you, yes. all these fear constraints of, of always being polite, like, and you go back to, okay, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna be like a kid, I'm gonna do what mm. I feel like now, if I want to jump in as a cow, I'm, I can do it, because it's allowed, everything is allowed, like, it's a world where everything is allowed. Exactly, and, yeah. And then, and then you create from that space, from that place in your heart, and then another person feels liberated to do the same and mm. to be able to join you in a scene. They have to, or they are invited to become a cow as well and, yeah. and conversate with you yeah. in that, in that uh, new world that you create together, which is nothing that has to do with the actual reality. And actually, mm. if someone comes in and say, what are you doing? We are in an office. This is not a, a car or like, what are you doing? You're behaving weird. That will ruin the scene. That will ruin the whole show. Because so everyone, everyone needs to join. And that's something that when I do see children playing, you realize that they're not constrained by any ideas of shame. And I did some teaching for some time where I would always find the children would become very tense when their parents were around, if I was drawing with them or anything. And it's because the parents would immediately place, if the child did something that was strange or something, the parent would point it out that, oh, that's weird. Why are you doing that? And I found this very, it was a very common thing amongst parents. And it was usually to do with the parent's shame and the yes. parent's sense of embarrassment over nothing, which is just a child being a child and enjoying themselves. But children don't feel those things. If they want to put a cat and a basketball in a painting and call it a flower, they're not yeah. going to, you know, they're not going to be like, that's not a flower. They'll be, yeah. another child will, if they're at the right age, go, oh, that is a flower. And they'll join in the, I mean, you could call it delusion, but I like to call it like, it's a sense of freedom and it's a sense of, you know, they can pivot in any direction. They're free to do what they want with their minds. And as an, as an adult, you have to take every layer of, of, you know, any parameter you have and discard it and say, okay, you know, that doesn't belong in the studio. The studio is a place where you take the constraints of society and you push it out and you say, okay, this is not, really important to me and yeah improv is a great way of doing that as well that's a it's such a brilliant tool and I, I did a lot of theater when I was at school up until 18 and it really helped me get rid of my any feelings of embarrassment that I had around talking or speaking in public or you know doing strange things like <laughs> rehearsing you know all the exercises you do but where you run around like a nutter yes. <laughs> I, lo I love that stuff and sometimes I think oh I need to go back and do that because occasionally you feel shame creeping in you feel yeah. fear creeping in 
and you need to just like kick it and say get out of my life because it's not important and it makes your life very difficult actually um but yeah there's there's so many ways of of growing out of these things uh and i feel like if more people did these things they feel less stressed and less shame by themselves all of that i i think i don't know but yeah yeah um, so I, we have a question from Sylvia that I want to read you here that is going, goes back to the commercial work sort of dialogue because I know, how, I, I know a lot of artists in different disciplines that always struggle with what you said. Like, mm. And then I'm gonna, I want to go towards nature and the woman. Wo woman. Mm. So let's, mm -hmm. let's reply to Sylvia. Sylvia asks, uh, uh, would you do the commercial work in your own way and still aware there is your name and style on it? Or you just do what you know people want? How do you balance that mm. while creating it? I mean, in a way, if you're making something that you like, that aesthetically and thematically kind of challenges you, and it happens to be commercial, because commerciality is something that is very new, I feel like. It's a very unusual concept for me, if something appeals to people's innate understanding of, you know, colour and light and the body and nature, it's you is to me I use the word as is universal because I think all human beings are programmed to understand those themes and see those things. In the modern world, it might someone might see that and see that as commercial because it can sell easily. But then commerciality is a very conscious thing. I think you, you know, I'm consciously being commercial. I've confected this way, this painting or this song in order for it to sell easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a whole other headspace, which I feel like I probably could never get to because it requires a lot of self, you have to be very self-conscious to understand what other people will like. Mm -mm. You, if you see something you like, you register that and you go, oh, that's because it's commercial. But I, you know, it's a very, com it's a dang for me, it's a very dangerous territory, commerciality. If yeah. it, what you do happens to appeal to a lot of people and uh, a, gallery likes it and says we want you to represent you then great that's a happy accident but to make work in order for that to happen is a whole other thing which yeah. i don't i don't know if i could do that or have the like ability to plan yeah. <laughs> a lot of my life is like oh it happened to happen that way which is yeah. great yeah it means that you're going the right direction yes i understand you might feel like if you actually created the work in order to be commercial it can kind of like hit your sort of like integrity uh, level maybe you can feel subconscious and feel am i being authentic to myself or am i doing this being like too much thinking of something that is not what i need to focus on exactly so yeah, it, it yeah. can be yeah oh yeah. sylvia says thank you big heart okay oh. great i'm glad we replied to your question now um um, I really liked, oh my God, I have so many things I want to discuss and I'm aware <laughs> that the Instagram lives are one hour uh, are and they? they cut off. So okay. I don't know whether we should start an extra one or I already invited two other guests of mine to do a second round and carry okay. on with some of the conversations okay. because yeah. they are like, I get so much inspiration from you <laughs> and I, I really want to, and more and more things come up <laughs> that I want to discuss. <laughs> Um, so we can do actually one one sort of like reflection and question on this relationship and this role of woman between and the, as a link between nature and humanity that mm, I found mm, on, your, mm, on your reflections and have us have a little conversation and yeah and then let's see if we can if we have time for more but that was something that I really liked about your statement and your your work yes um, so where does Thank the woman like yeah. Well, in a way, because I was looking at a lot of historical, um, like religion, not historical, but animist religions mm -hmm. um, in parts of the world beyond the Western kind of, not even Western, but the Christian, uh, the Abrahamic faiths, which 
historically take power away from women yeah. in the in the context of the way that women is seen in the world they are seen as almost like an an extra bit on the end of humanity oh and women instead of women and men they're like yeah. men and also some of those women so in in that in that regard and and women are always a peripheral character within these stories and these societies they are the add-on they're not thought that i think women should be the central uh, character necessarily but historically the role of the woman the role of the female uh, whatever form that came in female energy you know because not all femininity is in a uh, in a gendered female body it can be in many ways yeah and for me the female energy has been or the female body has been so maligned and so kind of pushed to the the side of society much like nature you know nature has been paved over it's been cut down it's been it's been made into like a a disney attraction where you go and see it and then you come home and you throw loads of plastic in the bin it's not really attended to it's not um thought of as a central character despite it being central to our lives and our survival women are central to our lives and to our survival you don't get children if you don't get women if you don't have women uh but there's this always i feel this relationship that society has with women where we're almost a nuisance you know you're useful when it comes to one thing but then if you express yourself in any other way beyond that then you're complaining you're stressing people out you're emotional you're um you're too fat you know you're you're too much but as long as you're serving the the kind of group need for 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 sex and for reproduction then it's great and i think in a way there's been a reversal of um development in this area there's been this kind of you know obsession with changing your physicality in order to get something from society but society is wrong in the first place so why change yourself Mm-mm. be more of yourself and society will grow to understand more of you is my feeling yeah um and how that links to nature is as i said you know nature is taken for granted women are taken for granted women's work is taken for granted the the yes. you know the, during lockdown i think the role of women has been seriously undervalued the fact that women will have to will probably have been balancing children and balancing work as many men have but they know that the the weight of um work falls unfortunately on women most of the time they do the they do the washing up they do the cleaning and they also go and have a work meeting at 12 o'clock so you know there's no break and yeah. i feel like for me it's very much important to to focus on the female identity and what it means and how kind of nature can free us from all of these um far more than being in a city or being in a society when you're out in nature no one's looking at you no one's judging you for the way you look no one's looking at the money you earn or the clothes you wear or any of that it's completely you're free of it and yeah. that for me is a very attractive uh concept and possibly the way forward out of things like uh you know the environmental destruction that we're living in or lack of food or lack of healthy food or lack of exercise you know if you go out there and see the world it's an incredibly beautiful place and i wish more people were able to and would do it um and yeah because i find like the home especially the domestic space for women it can often be a very stressful environment it's a very strained environment whether it be the relationship you have or the children you've had or your parents or whatever there's a lot of pressure put um on women to conform uh and for me i just i just want to kick all those boundaries away from me and just you know 
I've always felt that sense of, you know, outrage at that. Why do I have to do something that other people don't? Yeah. Is my sense. I don't know how you feel about those things. Yeah, I mean, A, I had shivers all the way through your last response. B, uh, so because I 100% I identify in these and absolutely I want another, uh, another of these chats to talk about these because that's like a theme I'm really close to and I really want to talk more about. So absolutely, this is going to be probably our next theme. But yeah, I do agree. Like I grew up like at home uh, where like you know we were having dinner or lunch or something and then at the end of the meal my dad would be like okay chloe go and wash the dishes mm. and why me and not my brother like mm. what? you know like it's yeah i mean i didn't in a way i feel the outrage because i grew up in a very equitable home in many ways like everything was shared out evenly my dad you know is more practical in certain areas so he would do that work and my mum was more practical in certain areas so she would do that but it wasn't split across gender lines it was split on who was interested in it and who was good at it and who was most useful at that thing and so I was always very sporty and like I'd be up trees and I'd be doing all of that kind of stuff and I kind of in some ways saw myself maybe possibly within a more male light when I was growing up because no one said oh you shouldn't be doing that or, go and sit down or no one gave me that constraint so when I'm out in the world as a woman and a woman who doesn't necessarily like blend into the rest of the population I'm I feel this kind of sense of maybe wrong wrongfully I feel this sense of outrage like you know do you know how capable I am do you know what I can do do you know how strong I am, where I can go, uh, do you know what's inside my mind? You know, all of these things are constantly rushing through my head when I'm out in the world, when people belittle me. I remember yeah. I was uh, in a, I went to a gig with my boyfriend and this um, guy said, he came up to us and he knew the person I was talking to and my boyfriend and he, he said hello to both of them. I was standing in a circle of three and he, he didn't, he, it was like, he just didn't see me. It was so fascinating. And that's happened to me so many times whereby, um, I'll be in a situation with mainly men and they'll all recognize one another. And then for me, that it's almost like they won't address me. And, and it started to happen around the age where I left university and everyone started working and doing all of that stuff. And it just enrages me. I'm like, yeah. and I'm sure many women have experienced these things um, working. And, I, and if you work around a lot of women, it happens less so. But if you work in mixed environments or environments with mainly men, it's fascinating how kind of invisible you become if you don't force yourself into the world um, and, and be very forthright with your opinions and your attitudes and the way you are. I think that's the only option you have in a way yeah. to be that way. Yeah. Um, okay, Kemi, the Instagram is saying to me, we have one minute remaining before Whoa. they shut us down. Let's say bye, but then I, let's, I'm going to start a new live just to finish off the conversation. Because okay, it's like great, great. let's do it. Okay, so bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> come back and say goodbye. Yeah, exactly. Come back. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>